let me uh, start there and, and also let you know um, also let you know that I'm going to get somewhat personal with you today. Uh, this is a presentation that I have worked on for three weeks. Uh, when I say worked on, I've been working doing the research for quite a bit of time, for years. But in terms of getting ready for tonight, I've been working on that for three weeks. And, and I say that because it's been something that even in the time of preparation for a presentation like this, I've become more aware of my own lenses in a hyper way. Um, in a, and, and I teach diversity. I mean, that's what I do. I teach. I'm the chief diversity officer here at the university, um, special assistant for inclusion. And so it's my job to have UVU to, to invite UVU employees and students to develop new lenses of how to view the world and how to appreciate the differences that are in the world. But let me answer this question if I can, because I did get a few of my friends reach out and say, "Why did they have you do this at the women's conference?" And so a couple of things. I'm a diversity scholar, and I usually speak about issues of lenses, perspectives, um, and first paths, um, and why things matter uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. Not just the workplace, but in all of our relationships and interactions. All right? Second, the research about women and minorities, or people of color, in the workplace share many parallels in terms of biases faced and recommendations for advancement. So if you look at the literature on how do you have uh, minorities in the workplace also advance and get opportunities, much of that literature parallels with uh, gender studies or women in the workplace. Third, um, as she mentioned, the first time that she's invited men to participate in this, but I, I did remind her, I said at one point, I know because I helped him get ready for it, President Holland spoke on a panel um, called Why Men Should Care About Women's Issues. And there was a panel and there was, I don't know if anybody attended that, but um, they were trying to increase the participation of men at these. Um, and I also just want to let you know that this is also just an opportunity for me to think out loud with you on this process of discovery of my own lenses. I've been trying to get better at this stuff. And this stuff means at understanding how other people might view the world, might be experiencing the world in a way that I am, have not experienced, right? And so uh, part of my exploration of this today, um, quite sort of openly and vulnerably, is to let you know that this is still a process for me. And I have to check my privileges and lenses and my assumptions and my biases on a daily basis, even as I preach to people that they need to check their lenses and biases and assumptions, okay? So with that said, um, let me just uh, share with you where, I, where I'd like us to go. And I also see, I want to thank a few of my colleagues, uh, I see a number of colleagues here, but in the School of Ed, I've been a, a professor, an assistant professor in the School of Ed now for about four years, and in the School of Education, I've learned a whole bunch from my colleagues. And um, one of the things that I've learned is, is this idea of, of backwards design, and that's where you know where you want to go with this whole class or this lesson, and so then you, you then have the objectives and then you back up and how do we get there? And one of the things that we talk about quite a bit when it comes to any topic, right, uh, within the School of Education, math methods, multiculturalism, science methods, technology, is this idea of scaffolding the what we're learning. Then you go into a so what, why does that matter? Why are we even learning this? The relevance of that what in our lives. And then now what do we do with it? What's the skills that we develop? It also so happens that these, this um, pattern mirrors intercultural competence development for communication. So if you want to develop intercultural competence or literacies, you learn the awareness, the what, the understanding, the so what, and then the skill development, the now what. So that's what I'm going to walk us through today, if that's all right. I'm going to have about an hour with you. And there's going to be some portions of this. I'm warning you now. I'm a, I'm a professor. There's some parts of this where I'm actually going to have you chat with one another for like 30 seconds. You're going to have to engage at some point, not necessarily here, but nearby. Okay? <laughs> I'm just warning you. I also have some handouts. And I also have my card up here if you want a copy of the entire <coughs> slideshow. I also know that they're streaming this and some of the other stuff. So you'll have copies of everything that I share today, including the research. All right? With that, let's take a ride. What is bias and what is unconscious bias? Um, I love this photo because it reminds me of something that happened to me not too long ago. When I was starting my doctoral program, I was starting to read um, tons of articles uh, at the University of Utah, tons of articles um, each week, right? I would get assigned all these articles to read. And I noticed, after a little bit of time, that I could not see beyond about 10 feet. So about this third row right here, Beyond that, everybody else was blurry, and it was affecting my driving. And I will reveal to you now, even though I know this live stream, 
I won't read you now, but I was, I was driving under those conditions um, for a little while, just a little while, a couple years. So <laughs> I, went to the, I went to Shopco, and there's an optometrist, there was an optometrist in Shopco in Orem. All right, so I went to Shopco in Orem, and I saw this optometrist, and she did a whole bunch of things with something like that. And I got air puffed into my eye. You all, some of you know what I'm talking about, okay? If you wear contact glasses, you have laser surgery, you know, air puffed into the eye. And then all of a sudden she's like, read that, read the lines there. And I'm like, okay, fine, I'm good. I got the top line. And then all of a sudden the second line, I'm like, uh, there's like a niner in there or something. Then she's like, well, what about now? What about now? What about this one? And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, wait, go back. That one, that was awesome. I can read the bottom line. She goes, great, try these on. I would put the lenses on. I walk outside of that area, the optometry area, and I looked to the back of Shopco and I saw the garden area. And I could see like what was on sale back there. And I was like, it was this Hitchcock moment where I was like, oh my gosh. The floor came up and I was stepping literally like this. Because if you've ever gotten a prescription for the first time, you know what I'm talking about with that depth perception. So I, I, I was, I could see. And then I was using these glasses and I started working with President Holland. This is about the same time. And then towards the end of that time, I was working with President Holland as his assistant. I, um, I was about to graduate, finishing up my dissertation, and with my glasses on, the same thing was happening. About 10 feet out, again, the people beyond that were blurry. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. I've got glasses on. Something's messed up here. So I went back, guess what? Same optometrist was there five years later. Same one, okay? So I show up, and she does the same thing, and I say, I'm sorry, doctor, can I just ask a question? Because I'm really curious, I'm no expert in eyes, but I thought the glasses were supposed to fix my eyes forever, <laughs> like forever. She goes, no, no, your, your lenses, they shift over time. It's called, there's a little scientific thing called age. And I was like, thanks, Tom. So she, I said, well, so if I get LASIK surgery though, that fixes it forever. And she's like, no, no, that's a sweet thought. There's, it goes about 10 years, and then after a while you see some spots, and then later on, again, age kicks in and all this stuff. And I said, well, I didn't know it was happening. It was just all of a sudden blurry over time. She goes, this is what happens with your lenses. I want you to hold on to this image for just a second as we begin to talk about bias. Because where do biases come from? Biases creep up on us. They don't all of a sudden make your vision blurry, where all of a sudden you're looking at something, all of a sudden, boom, you're blurry. And I'm like, what just happened? Out of focus. It's over time, something shifts. And it's because of life experiences. And let me walk you through some of this, all right? So this is an artist's depiction of a brain scan, if you will, not really. This is, um, this is an artist's depiction of just what's, what might be happening in the brain. The hot points are the neurons. The lines between the hot points are synaptic connections. If anybody in here is a professor of psychology, neurology, um, don't, don't correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. So, the, the hot points are neurons, synaptic connections between the neurons, and we're born with billions of these, right? And what happens is the moment we're born, and some might argue actually before we're born, but most child psychologists will say that it really starts to pick up when we're born, because we're taking in information through all our senses, that all of a sudden all this information is, is just is firing, okay? And so, let me share a, a quick example, or let me share a quick story. January 4th of this year, uh, my wife, her name is Michelle, you're going to get to know her because I'm going to have photos. Um, my wife gave birth to our daughter, Anpea. Now our daughters, all our kids' names, have, kids have Hawaiian first names, Navajo middle names. I'm Hawaiian, Japanese, Filipino, Spaniard. My wife is Navajo and Ivank, which is an indigenous tribe right where China, Mongolia, and Russia all connect. So my kids are Hawaiian, Japanese, Filipino, Spaniard, Navajo, and Ivank, right? Okay, we're, we're good? We're, we're following? Okay, so... Michelle gives birth to Anuhea at Utah Valley Regional Medical Center on January 4th, 2017. Just try to remember where you were January 4th and just be like, oh, that's what Anuhea was for. <laughs> when, when we were at Utah Valley Regional Medical Center, the nurses came to us and gave us a little pack, packet of information. And they said, Mr. Reyes, Ms. Reyes, here's um, the packet of information. And on this one portfolio side, there's information about nursing and, and this and that. And we said, Great, not our first child, we'll read through it, awesome. But then I noticed that there was still this pamphlet called the Skin to Skin Information, Skin to Skin Program. Now, any nurses in here? Okay, so nurses are familiar with Skin to Skin Research. The idea that instead of taking the newborn baby, as soon as the umbilical cord is cut, 
with the rubber gloves on at the nurses over to the warming station, and again, I don't have the right terminology down, so over to this warming station, to then get cleaned up, then swaddled, then brought back to the exhausted mother who just gave birth, right? All like comfy cozy, like swaddled this beautiful baby. Instead, as soon as the umbilical cord is cut, they will take the newborn naked child and place her on the mother's upper chest to make a skin-to-skin -skin connection, okay? Because research shows that that first connection is so important. And of course, snarky Kyle was like, okay, yeah, that's fine, because like indigenous people have been doing this forever, so that's cool. Um, so yeah, you, you can do that. So I cut the umbilical cord, the nurses took baby Anuhea, placed baby Anuhea crying, she's crying, she's got my lungs, and then she, they place her on Michelle's upper chest, and guess what happens? Michelle starts caressing the baby's cheek, okay? Starts caressing the baby's cheek, baby on the cheek. And she starts humming this song, right? And what is this song? What are these songs? It's Navajo, basically one, two, buckle my shoe, right? And something ha is happening in Anahea's brain at that moment. Anahea's brain is starting to make for the first time processing, coding information that's pretty important because what's, what happens is over time, she hears that same mother's voice processing the smell then gets nursing, and she processes this over and over again, and without even realizing, she's processing where she feels safe, where she feels loved, where she belongs, she feels like she's cared for. Now, it's not like the moment she touched down on Michelle, and Michelle started caressing her cheek, and was like coming to her or singing to her, baby Anahe was like, oh, the sweet sounds of Navajo. Like, right, she wasn't cognizant of that. She was basically, though, able to make a connection and that connection has continued on. So this is Michelle and Anuhea. This is about, this is hours after. And here's what's happening in the brain. And by the way, I want you to think about this because it continues through childhood. We are little social scientists. We gather information, we process information. So let me just give you an example. In kindergarten, take yourself back to wherever you went to kindergarten. I went to Hamlin Street Elementary in Canoga Park, California. In kindergarten, you go and you you wear your hair a certain way, and people laugh at you, and then you don't wear it that way again. You've collected data, you're like, don't like that feeling, and then you wear your hair differently. Let's take another example. Let's just say, for example, hypothetically speaking, there was a boy in the third grade at Hamlin Street Elementary that decided to want, he wanted to wear a leather Michael Jackson jacket with zippers everywhere, and matching leather Michael Jackson ja pants with zippers everywhere, and, oh, I don't know, maybe wanted to make his hair like Christopher Reeve with uh, Superman, all right? Now let's just say, hypothetically, this boy went to school and was teased. Do you think he wore that outfit again? Well, he did at home. <laughs> he did at home uh, when he was practicing his moves. But at school, he never wore it again. And part of that is we code, we process these things. And, and people don't realize that this has happened at such a young age. That's why early childhood education is so important. We process where we feel a sense of belonging, safety, love, whether or not we're smart and, and can do things, our talents, our identity, and who we can connect with. All right, do you wanna see a picture of Anuhea now? This was taken two weeks ago. All right, that's her. I wake up to that. So I'm over here like in my state of sleep and then all of a sudden I feel a foot up in my jaw and then I look over and she's just looking at me. And I just can't, I, and I'm just like paralyzed. I'm like, what do I do now? She's made eye contact. And, uh, and then I, and I'm late to work. So don't tell President Holland that that's why I'm late to work. Okay? Neurons then. So let's, this is my drawing. And so every synaptic connection between these neurons is processing information. And here's the key. If you see it again and again and again and again, it becomes what we consider to be a schema or a truth in our mind of our existence. Meaning, if you are told that you're smart, over and over and over again by various people. That code, that synaptic connection between those neurons actually begins to process a truth in your mind that you actually are smart. Conversely, if you are told that you're dumb or that you will never amount to anything, those messages, whether explicit or implicit, subtly or overtly, they tell you a certain truth about you or what you perceive to be a truth. So you, you process a belonging or fit, you process safety, intelligence, and these develop what are called schema in your brain, also how you view the world. And I'm gonna help you understand what, what I mean by that in just a second. 
Finally, it leads to the way we act in society based on what we consider to be our role in society. Has anybody ever done drama or theater? Come on, folks, if we've done drama or theater, let's admit it. <laughs> I was Willy Wonka in the eighth grade. <laughs> Nothing screams Willy Wonka like a short Hawaiian Filipino boy that can't sing. <laughs> but uh, I went with it, okay? You know what I did, no joke, by the way? <laughs> Instead of singing Pure Imagination, you know that song? Come with me, I, I like rapped it. <laughs> I was like, Pure Imagination. Okay. Um, okay, drama. People that have done film or drama. What is a script? Anybody? What's a script? Your lines. What else? What else, what else does it tell us? Stage, Stage directions. Wonderful. What was that? Somebody called something else out. Body movement. Body movement. Tell us the story. Thank you. And I love that. Just finally, you're like, you know what? I'm just going to say, go for it. <laughs> a script. Let's take this for society for a second. A script tells us who the heroes and heroines are, who the villains are, where you're supposed to go, who has a main role, who has a, a role in the shadows, who's supposed to stand there like a tree the entire time and not say anything. It tells you when to exit and when to enter, and how long you're supposed to stay on stage, and then how long you're supposed to be off stage. It tells you all these things. Well, society does the same thing. And here's what it does. It tells you certain things based on who gets to be at the table, who gets to be on stage in this play, who's in positions of authority, who's in positions of leadership. And if I don't see people, folks, this is tracked through psychology, if I don't see people that share my identities, however I consider my identities, in positions of authority or leadership or influence, why would I ever process in my brain that I could actually achieve that unless somebody were to help flip the script for me, purposefully, okay? So where do biases come from? Let me invite you to think about something for a second. If we were to have another hour, I would invite you to do a whole bunch of um, mapping exercises where you would go through and do some of these. So I want you to just look at these li this list of questions and answer them for yourself. <coughs> Ascribed characteristics are characteristics about your life that you had no control over. You were born into. Okay? You were born into these characteristics. So questions. What, where, what were you born into? Things you, which, over which you had no control. Your first language, geographic location, family structure, birth order, family religion or worldview, family political leanings socioeconomic status, gender, ability, disability. Um, I'll tell you right now, I was born in Los Angeles to a fa family that loved the Lakers and the Dodgers. Like, I had no choice in that, all right? I was basically robed in a purple and gold onesie, all right? And so that's part of my ascribed characteristics, right? And now I want you to think about something. Have you answered some of those questions in your mind? Now I want you to answer this question, so what? How do these ascribed characteristics affect the way you actually view the world today? Because if you had different ascribed characteristics, you might view the world a little bit differently. If you were raised by a single parent, or if you were raised by grandparents, or a guardian, or a father and mother, those are all different scenarios that might have you view the world differently. Obviously, religious views, political views, right? But your ascribed characteristics, folks, have influenced the way you view the world, and they actually influence your biases. They influence your natural proclivities without you even realizing it. Because guess what? It's been coded in your brain over time without you actively wanting to put it there. Second, roles and hats. What roles and hats, roles do you wear, or do you play? Hats do you wear? What responsibilities do you have? What titles do you carry? Who depends on you? And think about this throughout time. If you can answer those questions, the next question then is, so what? With these roles that you've had, and you've moved into, in and out of spaces of, of influence, why does that matter in how you view the world? Well, it matters greatly, folks. If you have been, if you at a very young age became responsible for other young people, it definitely influenced how you viewed the world and a sense of responsibility, and your childhood got shortened, okay? If you were an only child, or if you had uh, multiple siblings, but then you had certain roles and responsibilities you had to play within that family structure, or you had to go to work, that influenced how you viewed the world over time. And it's not like it's a stark moment where all of a sudden your vision goes blurry. It creeps up on you, and all of a sudden, five years later, you're like, huh, I look at the world a little differently than I did five years ago because of the responsibilities I've had. Final category, experiences. Think about the major experiences you've had in your life that influence who you are today, positive or negative. 
Person, place, incident, life-changing or turning events, experiences that affect your state of living, state of mind, your emotions, your motivation, your trajectory. Let me give you a few examples. Have any of you learned a new language ever? You've had to learn a new language. Okay. What, just think for yourself, what has that done for your perspectives on the world? And for your perspectives on a different culture and a different linguistic background? All right? Have any of you, don't answer this one, but have any of you experienced tragedy or traumatic experience in your life? And how has that affected how you view the world in terms of trust, in terms of relationships, in terms of gender, in terms of race, whatever it might be? How has that the incident, that experience affected you, and what, at what age did it happen, and how much, how intense in terms of the way it's affected you? How about positive things? Where because somebody believed in you, some coach, some music teacher believed in you, it completely changed the tra trajectory of your life, and because of their influence, you look at the world differently now than you did before. If anybody has ever switched political parties or religious associations or affinities, you know what I'm talking about then when you say, you think about what you were born into and over time your experience is leading you to think about the world perhaps differently. I wanna do an experiment really, with you really quickly and I, want you to, I don't want you to overthink this, but I want to illustrate why it's so dangerous to have some of these hidden biases. Now, as soon as I do this experiment with you, you're gonna catch on pretty quickly, but that's the point. Um, I'm gonna say a word and an image of a person will come to your mind. Don't overthink it. Don't be like, I know what he's doing, so I'm not going to go there. And then be like, yeah, I got him. Like, an image is going to come to your mind, so just be honest with yourself. Um, of a person. Think about the gender, the race, what this person might be wearing when I say the word terrorist. Boom, I already said it. It's, it's out there. An image came to your mind. Now, can I, by a raise of hands, how many of you had a woman just come to your mind? Boom, a woman came to your mind. One. Okay. Okay, right? How many of you had then that had males, or a man come to your mind, had a white male come to your mind? One, usually there's five or six, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay? All right. Now, if I asked that same question 30 years ago, or to a different set of, in a different country, or to Native Americans 60 years ago, or whoever, right? It, the context matters. But here's what's scary. I, I, we already know the punchline of that, right? Because I know what the majority of people in here, what image came to your mind because I too am a consumer of society. I too am a human that has lived post 9-11. I too have seen the same media that you have seen. And so here's what's scary though. It's not like all of us got together and we said, hey folks, today we're going to actively put something in our brains. So we're going to get a whole bunch of demographic cards together, right? Canadians. Okay, Tongans, all right, Filipinos. We're gonna get all these different race and, and, and demographic cards together, and then we're gonna stare at a card so that we can actively put an image in our mind when it comes to the word terrorist. We haven't had to do that. And here's what politicians and marketers know so well. They become psychologists, or, or they've actually, they, they read psychology. And I say this because we've seen it happen, where you just repeat something over and over again, even if it isn't true. And even if you have some cognitive dissonance, you say, you know what, that's not true. If I repeat it to you enough, that's all that matters. I've already put it in your brain. As a consideration. As a consideration. So folks, biases come from our experiences and they come from just living. And rarely, we don't even check them. We, we, we hardly ever check our, our own biases and our assumptions. Okay? Anais Neem famously said, we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. I want you to just think about that quote for just a second. We don't see things as they really are or as they are, we see things as we are, meaning we see something in relation to our collective life experiences because we can all watch something and completely walk away with a different uh, conclusion about that experience, correct? We can watch the same thing happen in an accident from different perspectives, and we all, because of our lenses, and because of our histories, we will interpret that same exact incident in different ways. All right. How many of you are really into TED Talks? Um, it's okay to admit. Uh, I like a good TED Talk every once in a while, every day. 
Um, this particular one, how many have seen the one called Danger of a Single Story um, with Chimamanda Adichie? Can I just tell you now, it'll be worth your, the tuition you paid today to go home and watch this 19 minute talk by this amazing woman called Danger of a Single Story. I will not steal her thunder tonight, I promise, but I am gonna share a few quotes from her, all right? What she essentially says, without stealing the thunder, right, is beware of the single story we formulate about other people because of our lack, lack of exposure and dialogue with the other people. Does that make sense? Beware of the single story we formulate about other because of our lack of exposure, interaction, immersion, and dialogue with the other. So here's what's interesting. She says, so that is how you create a single story. You show people as one thing, as only one thing, over and over again, and that is what they become. Folks, there are people right now who are trying to lump entire communities together and tell the public, these people are like this, over and over and over again. And whether or not you agree at the beginning, it's still being put out there, all right? Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. When I speak to students, and I try to tell them why to get an education, here's what I tell them. And especially when I go into juvenile homes, and I go into to speak with students that everybody else has given up on, and I'll just say, first of all, wake up, okay? I'm not here to give you like a, oh, just try harder, like, I just, I just talk to them and say, look, if you want to become the author of your own story, all right, get an education. Because if you don't tell your story, somebody else is going to tell your story for you, and it's going to be wrong and incomplete, and they're going to be in control of your life. And so many of our youth today just want to be in control of their lives. Well, to be in control of your life, that's an education, all right? So become the author of your own story by getting an education. Get the words, get the language, get the understanding so that you can have control of your life and that you can counter stories that other people are telling about you, your background, your identities, what have you. Chimamanda Adichie, so wise. She also says, the problem with stereotypes is not that they're untrue, but that they're incomplete. They make one story become the only story. Let me see if I can unpack this a little bit. How many of you know what this um, device is? Um, wonderful. I'm not gonna make a judgment about who raised their hands based on age in this audience, but when I have shown this photo to my students, my incoming freshman students, a few of them are like, I've seen that on Harry Potter. <laughs> this we know to be a card catalog. How many of you remember using one of these? Wonderful. Somebody please volunteer and tell me, how do you use one of these? First you find a librarian. Thank you. Dewey Decimal System. Dewey Decimal System. Exactly. And then you go in there and you look it up by that number okay. and find the book. Beautiful. Beautiful. But author last house. name and other there's things. No house, there's no yeah. You would go to the wall and then you get, you're like, it's right here, it's right here. And then you're like, no, it's missing. <laughs> <laughs> and so then you had to wait two weeks for somebody else to finish their project. Not that I've ever experienced. Okay. Let's pretend for a moment that this is your brain. It's not a commercial, right? This is your brain. This is your brain. And remember, remember the schema, all the truths in our mind. Let's pretend that each set of information that's in your brain is actually categorized in the box, okay? Man, I wish I don't have this. Okay, so, so let's pretend for a moment we pull out the box, one particular box, and I'm gonna actually have you pull out a particular box, right? Middle Eastern males, okay? So this is a follow-up to what I assume to be um, the, the first exercise. You pull out the box of Middle Eastern males. Now let me ask you a question. How many of the cards, meaning pieces of information that you've gathered over your lifetime on Middle Eastern males, how many of those are positive and how many are negative? I just want you to be honest with yourselves. You don't have to answer right here. But here's what I'll, I'll ask for volunteers. How many of you in the room, the majority, 51% of the, of the cards in your Middle Eastern male box are positive? One, two, three, thank you. Okay, here's what I'd like to do. Those that raise their hands, can you tell me why? Why do you think they're positive? I studied abroad in Israel. And Study abroad. That's all you need to say. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, my neighbor in grad school. Neighbor. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. People, People that you've actually physically met. Yes. Thank you. You went immersed. Yes. Patient care. Patient care. Interacted with and cared for. Yes. Study abroad. Study abroad. Immersion in. Yes. Work for the Jordanian government. Okay. Are, is anybody seeing a pattern about the people that have positive experiences? 
Okay, so here's what happens in your brain. Without even knowing it, the rest of you have majority, not saying, but majority negative cards because of what? Lack of exposure. Are you a bad person? No. But if you're not at least willing to say, you know what, I, I actually just don't know much about because I haven't talked with, engaged with, immersed myself in, volunteered at, served, cared for, population X, then how are we ever, ever hoping to build bridges with land masses we know nothing about? Okay, so card catalog, boom. Positive, negative cards. All right, now pull out any other identity, any other identity. And just think, positive cards, negative cards. The ones that have the most positive is because you've had more exposure to those populations. Just be honest with yourselves, okay? Interreligiously, interreligiously. Now, some of you are saying, coming back here, you might be saying, oh, I had a lot of interaction with and exposure to, and it reinforced the negative things over here, right? Again, those, are, those can be bracketed, and those are part of this, is it an individual, or is it an entire group of people? Right? And so those are some of the questions that we have to unpack. But by and large, by and large, our assumptions in the lack of, in terms of um, an absence of communication, we fill in the blanks with our own assumptions about people. And where do we get information? Twitter. <laughs> okay, we get, no, I'm serious, we get sound bites about other people. And rarely do we have a chance to interact with people who are really different um, than us, okay? Let me move on because the time is running low. Let's review this first third, this first part. What is bias then? Prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, or group compared with another, usually in a way considered to be unfair. A particular tendency, trend, inclination, feeling, or opinion, especially one that is preconceived or unreasoned. The tendency to have an opinion or view that is often without considering evidence and other information. Meaning that biases usually are things that are quick reactions. By the way, biases also are part of survival. Um, uh, one of these scholars uh, out of Michigan shares a great story about um, our ancestors, uh, people who were cave people, and he imagines that the first person to see a dinosaur, right, go with me on this exercise that he, Steve Robbins takes us on, and he's like, oh, that dinosaur, long neck, flat teeth, great. Um, the data I'm collecting is a nice, nice thing. I'm not calling it dinosaur, it's a thing. Then all of a sudden, sees another animal, short arms, big teeth, and he's like, oh, probably nice, gets eaten. The other friends collect data. They're like, okay, sharp teeth, probably bad. We're gonna stay away because of their experiences, their lenses. Over time, part of the reason why we have biases or we have, we have to categorize things in our brain is because our brain wants to not work as hard. And we have to start to navigate this complex world. One scholar says that there's 10 million bits of information that are coming at us at any given moment, and we can only process 40 of them, 40 of them. His name is Brian Wheel, Dr. Brian Wheel, and he says, and so then we react then to the other millions of, of, of processes. We just react, we kick into habit modes and whatnot. Okay, can you just, in 30 seconds, turn to a neighbor, and what is one thing that clicked with you in anything that I've shared up to this point? One thing that clicked with you, turn to a neighbor, and how would you define bias now that we've unpacked a little bit about what bias might be? <laughs> Thank you. Let's move to the next section here on so what. Now that we, we are all experts at bias, and we're going to go home and share with people, and you're going to be like, your brain's like a card catalog. And they're like, what is a card catalog? Um, so what? what do we, why do we need to be aware of this? And this is where the unconscious bias really starts to kick in. And we, call, we talk about explicit bias, which is like, I know I don't like you, and I'm going to tell you I don't like you because of this. That's explicit. It's overt, it's, you know, it's bias, it's prejudice that's out there. Then there's this thing called unconscious bias. And that is, to your face, and this is the most prevalent form of bias, this is to your face, I like everybody. I don't see difference, I just love everyone, and so I'm gonna treat, I treat everybody the same, but I actually don't. I actually don't, I actually see difference, even when I'm trying not to see um, some difference. And let me talk about that for a second. Who here is left-handed? Oh, come on, lefties, raise your hands pretty proudly there. And let me make sure no lefties are raising their right hands, because that's happened before. <laughs> that's happened. Thank you. Only left-handers can speak right now. I've given you one hint up here, but what are, at what age did you realize you were left-handed? It wasn't last year, so what, at what age? And you're going to have to call it out, because I forget where you all are, so. Yes? When I couldn't wear my 
brother's baseball mitt that like, you know, four. Four, thank you. Baseball mitt didn't okay, so at a very young age, everybody else, left-handers, at a very young age, did anybody get you to try to learn how to do things the right way? <coughs> anybody? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I forget where you all are at, so. Yes, okay. Um, what are some things left-handers have to navigate in life or think about that right-handers don't have to think about? Yes? The scissors in elementary school. Right? Okay. <laughs> Hint up there. Scissors in elementary school. So let's play out this scenario. Young Kyle is in elementary school. I'm right-handed, but I'm going to play left-handed for a second. At Heaven Street Elementary, I'm like, oh, teacher, my scissors don't work. And the teacher comes over and is like, um, Kyle, the scissors are fine. You don't work. Next kid. So the teacher comes over and says, actually, Kyle, why don't you come over here to this orange juice can that I made that has two scissors that with a big L on it. That's for you. Those are special. You're artistic. Um, and so I get, and I'm like, oh, all of a sudden these scissors work. Thanks, teacher. What other things are things that you have to have, you've had to process that you're like, right-handers just probably don't ever think about. Where to sit at a table. Where to sit when you're eating. Yeah. In a booth? Give me a break. Right-handers can sit wherever they want. They just throw themselves in any part of that booth. <laughs> Lefties are like, I'm right here at the edge. And maybe the waiter or waitress will get me, but I'm, I'm going to take my chances. How about that little armrest that comes up on the wood? Where's that armrest? Oh, are you feeling, is this therapy right now? Because as soon as I said that, you're like, oh, the wood comes up on the right side of the desk. And so lefties have to do what? Turn their entire body and they're like, yeah, this is fascinating. And guess what? When they're writing, they're resting their hand on the three ring binders, the three rings of the three ring binder. Comfy? Yeah. Covered in ink. Wait, your hand is actually, hold on, is it actually covered in ink? It looked, the shadow made it look. And I was like, oh my gosh, we have an example. So, the dry erase board. When you're writing, you're erasing as you're writing, okay? <laughs> Sporting equipment. Conducting, the, how they teach people to conduct in music. Military equipment, okay? The list goes on and on and on. Everybody, pick up a writing utensil, if you have one. Just pick it up in your right hand. Pick it up in your right hand, read it. Now flip it to your left hand and try to read it. Oh, it's, you can't read it anymore, huh? It's backwards. <laughs> Yeah, because right-handers made pens for right-handers. It wasn't like somebody in the fact that of, the, of the pens that like, you know what? I wonder if we threw a couple of lefties in here. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. It's upside down. The thermometer. <laughs> I, so let's process this for just a second. Right-handers, do any of you right-handers have any sympathy or empathy because you were either have a child, you have a parent, you're married to, partnered with, a lefty. Anybody? Any right-handers? Okay, so by exposure to, you have gained some empathetic lenses. And so you might actually even be like, you anticipate, where you sit at a booth and you're like, oh, you know what, why don't you sit here, because I got you, you know? And then they're like, oh, you're so sensitive, right? Um, right-handers, you've never had to process like your right-handedness, right? Like you've never sat there and you've been driving one day, let's make this dramatic, it's raining, and you're driving and there's just, the groceries are rolling around somewhere, because that's what happens every time I drive, there's groceries rolling around the floor, and all of a sudden I'm driving and I, then I look and I'm just like, oh crap, this world was made for me, I'm right-handed. Like, we've never had that happen to us, like, right? We've never had that happen to us. And then we complain and we say, oh, left-handers, just adapt. Just adapt to the normal way, the way things are done. Okay. Let me share another example, another story. Just hold that thought for a second about right-handedness and left-handedness. When, uh, when my wife, when Michelle was 17, she was driving from the Navajo Nation up to, up to uh, Utah uh, for a conference, a Native American conference. And um, they, they, she was behind the driver, and she was unbuckled. And they hit a horse, which is not uncommon in the Navajo Nation. Uh, they hit a horse, and the horse quite literally went through the van, almost part of it, and then the van tipped on its side, and Michelle went on her side along the floor, and her arm was severed right here. And she was dragged about 150 yards, um, gravel to this day, and her hip stitches all down her left um, leg, um, part of her kneecap on the left side gone. When I met Michelle, um, I met her and she didn't have an arm, her arm came right here, okay? And as we've talked about starting a family and then having a family and then Anuhea was born, you all remember Anuhea being born? Um, that was Michelle with one arm, okay? This is Michelle. Um, 
in her Navajo, traditional Navajo attire with my older daughter, Kaimi. And um, let me just tell you for a second, I, Michelle cannot check out of this experience. She can't just all of a sudden be like, you know what, I've gained empathy. Let me put my arm back on and let me go to work and be normal again. No, it's, this is her experience. I have the privilege, I have the privilege of not having to wonder how to do a task with both my hands. Whereas Michelle has to always be thinking, how do I accomplish this? And be thinking through solutions to things. So simple. Uh, I cut all vegetables at home. Anytime we're preparing a meal together, it's like I'm over there and just, ooh, vegetables, right? And part of that is like, go ahead, try to cut an onion with one hand, <laughs> okay? Um, diapers. Um, she's a photographer. She holds her, she, in this arm is a stand, and she holds her camera like this because it's a pretty big SLR. So she does photography, all right? And all the various things that she does, and she engages in, she has her own business. And, and I have the privilege of being like, oh, yeah, I don't have, I, I, this whole day, I didn't have to think about the fact that I could use both arms freely, all right? One more story. Um, my uh, father, from the Philippines. He's an entertainer. I know, shocker. So he impersonates Elvis. I kid you not. I swear to you, if you're friends with me on Facebook, Peggy, right? Yes. My father's 79 years old. This is on Facebook Live. Sean can attest to this. My older brother can attest. Our father is an Elvis impersonator in the Philippines. Okay? 79 years old. He legit sounds like him, you guys. Like, for real. Okay? When we were little, he used to tuck us into bed at night. My, my sister and I shared a room. My brother had his own room. My sister and I shared a room with blue shag carpeting, okay? The black blue shag carpeting in between our two boat beds, they weren't boats, but you know what I mean, and was the water or lava, depending on how my sister wanted me to die. So I was like, oh, I'm walking on the water. She's like, it's lava, you burn and die. And I'm like, oh. So I go back on my bed, and I'm like, how come you're walking on it? She's like, I've got lava shoes. <laughs> Noreen, I'm hoping you're watching this right now. She's like, I got lava shoes, idiot. And then I'm like, well, Okay, so then I'm like, oh, look, I found lava shoes too. And she's like, it's water, you drown. And I was like, oh, gosh. Anyway, my dad would come in to the room at night and tuck us into bed at night. After we had a dinner, fill our bellies, we just knew it's comedy hour with dad, okay? So we'd go and get ready, and dad would come in, and he'd, he'd do all these impersonations, and he'd play the guitar and play us songs, and then he would kiss us on the forehead, say, I love you, and then he would tuck us into bed. This is a ritual. The next morning, my, my father was a stay-at-home father. He was an artist. So he had a gallery, an art gallery. So he'd paint. My mom was an educator. Los Angeles Unified School District for 40 years. She was a teacher and principal. Okay? So we stayed at home. Dad taught us how to cook, clean, all this stuff, right? And to draw and to paint. And so we, he would take us to school the next morning. I imagine, folks, I thought every child had that same existence. Right? I thought every child had an Elvis impersonator father. I tucked them into bed at night and whatnot. But here's what I found out later, especially as an educator now. What I tell my students is this. If you're going to go make an impact on the world as a teacher, become a champion for all students. And I mean all students. Because guess what? There's going to be students who show up to your classroom, and instead of being excited for their parent to tuck them in the night before, they're hiding from a parent because of abusive situations. Or they're trying to cover their ears because of screaming in the household. Or they didn't get a meal the night before, and they show up, and they have to take two forms of transportation to get to your school, and they didn't have school, they didn't have breakfast, and so then all of a sudden, if they're so tired, if they have their heads on their table, they're not bad kids. They're not bad kids. Does that make sense? And so I had a privilege, folks. Is my dad a bad person because he did that, and am I uh, feel guilty because I had that privilege experience? No. But I have to wake up to the fact that I had that, and not everybody did. And so, folks, my definition of this scary P word, oh, by the way, there's my family. My dad, my mom, my mom passed away two and a half years ago after 40 years of dedicated service as an educator. There's me trying to point to my sweet cheeks right there. All right, my brother, Sean, my sister, Noreen. Um, by the way, my sister and I are best friends now. And uh, my dad, the one that would uh, tuck us into bed at night. But here's my definition of privilege. Privilege is when you don't have to check your identity when you enter space. See, I started with left-handedness and right-handedness because frankly, nobody feels attacked, right? I mean, if I start privilege conversations in other ways, folks are like, wait a minute. But did anybody that's a right-hander feel like, wait a minute, I, I earned my right-handedness. Like, I worked hard for this, right? Like, 
Just chill. Like, I'm not attacking you. I'm right-handed. I just admitted that I'm right-handed, and that's okay. We're cool, right? So then, what about my wife's situation? I also admitted I was able-bodied privileged. Oh, and then there's other forms of privilege, meaning my dad tucked me into bed at night, and, and I didn't have to have the worry. I didn't have to spend the psychological toll or emotional toll that night not getting sleep and wondering if I'm going to fail my classes the next morning or even not even caring about school because there's so many more things that are more important. You see, it's not about blaming something on another individual. It's about recognizing the privileges you did have and using that privilege to open up doors of opportunity for other people. And this is where we now transition to gender bias. Because I can go on for days about other forms of bias all over, but this whole symposium is about women in the workplace or women in, in, in influence, women in the home, women in, all over that perhaps historically because of society's scripts for women about traditional roles and whatnot have communicated to you and to young women today that there are certain roles you play in society's play. And you have to behave in certain ways Systemic privilege, then, is a group of people who share identities that benefit from policies and practices that are considered normal, right, or traditional in society. What I mean by that is this. I am second generation educated. My mom was an educated person. My father was an educated person, meaning my father got a bachelor's degree in the Philippines. My mom got her master's degree. And we have, here at UVU, we have 38% of our students are first generation, first in their families to pursue a bachelor's degree. Folks, that's most 15,000 students. First in their families to pursue a bachelor's degree. Now, it does me no good to sit there and be like, well, I'm not privileged. I work hard to get where I want. I, I did work hard, but that doesn't matter. I grew up in a home where my mom was like, hey, did you do your homework? Hey, I'm an educator. Hey, take the ACT. Hey, there's this thing called the FAFSA, right? And students that I work with over time, they didn't necessarily have that, all right? And so these messages we're getting about where we belong, where we're fit, where we, where we feel safe, all this stuff has been bombarding our brains without us even realizing it, folks. What I'd like to do now, if I can invite um, somebody to help me pass these out, and before any men in the room think I'm attacking our uh, gender or sex here, um, this is called a male privilege checklist, okay? It's, um, there's about 100, I, I, I narrowed it down to 50, and um, I, I will say this, it's not, this is not a checklist to attack men or to somehow diminish men. This is simply an inventory to say, have you ever considered the fact that you don't have to think about this, that I, as a male, don't have to think about these issues? Can I just share a few um, examples with you? And as you look through this, sorry, can I just get one of those? And. Um, I'll just share a few with you, but you'll have the entire document, two pages. I can be confident that my coworkers won't think I got my job because of my sex, even though that might be true. If I fail in my job or career, I can feel sure this won't be seen as a negative against my entire sex's capabilities. The odds of my encountering sexual harassment on the job are so low as to be negligible. I am not taught to fear walking or jogging alone after dark in average public spaces. And the list goes on and on. Now again, can I just be clear one more time? I'm not attacking men. I'm not attack attacking my father, my brother, my uncles, me, the great men that I work with here at the university, other men of influence, or your neighbors. I'm simply asking, have you considered these questions and these before? Because these are part of the unconscious bias. And by the way, number 50, says, I have the privilege of being unaware of my male privilege. <laughs> right? Like, I, I have the privilege of not having, having to expend any emotional energy to be like, oh, you know what? Like, I probably should check my lens on this. and should, should check my, my speaking over women in, in a public meeting. They call mansplaining, okay? Because I can explain it better, or whatever, right? And you can see all along here, there's, there's um, uh, the, the lists there, but let me let me continue. Here are some more examples of gender bias in the workplace. I'd like to invite you while I take a sip of water here to just glance through those, if that's all right. Now, if any of them resonate with you, meaning you've experienced it, or or you're like, yep, I've seen that before. Um, you know, 
nod your head. Um, and uh, if you, again, if you've been in, this is not necessarily just in any particular industry, but this is traditionally in the workplace, whatever that workplace might be. Okay, I'm going to move to the next slide, which has another seven of these. Oh, are you taking a picture? Go ahead. Because you can get the slides as well, but. By the way, I, I know that some of you are thinking this is just anecdotal, like complaining. Folks, every single one of these has scores of research that back these up. Scores of research, okay? And I've got the reference lead list that I can uh, have all attached to this presentation. 40 studies, folks. Women with children are seen as less like leadership material and less dedicated to their jobs, the motherhood penalty. Men with children are seen as better leaders, the fatherhood bonus. If I show emotion, if I show emotion, and what I mean by that, if I tear up for whatever reason in a, in a meeting, I become, I've now become the sensitive male leader who's really in touch with this stuff. And by the way, I do get emotional because I'm passionate about this stuff. But a woman, my counterpart, might not be able to get emotional, otherwise less she be labeled as getting too emotional. Folks, um, this is the now why it matters, because it's actually affecting the workplace. It's affecting representation in leadership positions. It's affecting how we actually view women and men in terms of our traditional gender roles. Let's go back to ascribed characteristics. What were you born into? Whatever you were born into and you lived experience throughout your life, if your life experiences reaffirm that certain people had certain roles to play, then why would you think otherwise? Okay, why would you think otherwise? I reported to my mom growing up, she was a, a principal, all right? My first five bosses here at UVU were women. And then my next boss for the last eight years, President Holland, all right? But it was a fairly easy transition for me to report to a woman because my mom was like, strong as hell. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, let's move on. This study uh, from Brian Well, 2015. What makes a good manager? What are the attributes, characteristics of a good manager? Write those down, listing down. Then, what words would you typically use to describe a typical man, typical woman? And then they did an alignment exercise. And here's the finding. 71% of the words used to describe a typical man overlap with the words used to describe a good manager. Only 10% of the good manager words overlap with the words used to describe a typical woman. Now here's a question that somebody levied against me one day. They said, Kyle, ah, gender bias isn't just with men. It's with women too, about reporting to women. Women sometimes not wanting to report to women. Isn't that an issue? And I said, well, I haven't done that study, but let me go to the people who have. And Brian Well is one that has. And he says, yes, definitely. That women are sometimes just as harsh in rating other women when it comes to what good manager characteristics are or should be. Okay? So let's review the second portion before we go to our conclusion here. How does bias affect women? Biases affect our behavior, whether we like it or not. The majority of our behaviors are influenced by our unconscious biases. In the workplace, women and persons of color have historically been and currently being adversely affected by biases about their sense of fit and expectations of credible behavior. What do I mean by credible behavior? I mean the behavior that we usually look at to say, that's gonna be a good leader one day, right? Let's go to the golf course and let's talk about their future. Um, in explicit, overt, and implicit covert ways, women and girls are receiving messages that they are expected to fulfill certain workplace tasks and roles due to society's perceptions about the characteristics of women. And you saw that research. Can I end and the last part of this on a sense of optimism and hope. Because I know sometimes I share this data and it just reinforces either this sort of anger um, or it sort of introduces people to say, wow, I had no idea how bad it was in certain ways. I think we need to simultaneously wake up to the realities of what the data is telling us about lack of representation of women in positions of influence. And also though, actively work on things to, um, to change that. So, now what? What do we do with this information? How do we advance opportunities for women? I have a, one more handout. This is, I tried to put it down to one page. 
And this is, I was going to say 40, there are like 38 studies, meta-analysis down to one page of what I think is the best, what the research says, is the best recommendation for us to actually make a difference on this topic. Okay. Um, can, actually, can I just hold that hand out at the very end? Because I just want them to, to, to stay with um, this uh, slide really quickly. Here's the five basic categories of recommendations. Feel free to take a picture of this slide, but this, or you can, you're going to have the entire research right here. Don't feel like you're not. But let me walk through these really quickly because I only have seven minutes left. Educate women and men about second generation gender bias. You're going to be like, what's second generation gender bias? It's basically the implicit unconscious bias. Create safe identity workspaces to support transitions to your roles. Create a culture of accountability. Identify women in our lives and their influence on us. This is a very and by the way, these are all recommendations for men and women. This is a very empowering exercise, and I'll show you that in just a second. Anchor women's development efforts in a sense of leadership purpose rather than how women are perceived. Meaning, let's do less of the how women should dress for success and more of the let's find how you're going to make an impact on this world and then go get that. And by once you find your sweet zone and you're passionate about something, that will get recognized because all of a sudden when people find their zone, those leadership qualities emerge no matter what. But when they feel like they have to perform <coughs> something to, to be somebody else that they're not, or act in a certain way, that's never authentic, and that's perceived as well. Let's move through each of these. You're gonna get, again, oh, I'm just telling you, the teaser, you're gonna get all right here. Dearth of role models of, for women. Um, this aspiring leaders these role models whose styles and behaviors they can experiment with and evaluate according to their own standards and others' reactions. Here's what's let me give you an example, and I'm just going to tell you about UVU right now, okay? UVU is lacking senior leadership, uh, a representation of women's senior leadership overall, all right? And well, one the of the things that- the whole state is, right? The whole okay, state. can I go there? I just wanted to be like, okay, it's in our backyard too, because I don't want to blame the whole state. Yeah, we can. I wanted to own up to the crap, but we have to, right? Yeah. So the whole state, nation, should we just keep going? Yeah. All right. Let me go back to UVU. I love this place. I love this place. I've been here 14 years. But I also recognize when we have gaps, when we have to make some improvements. We have, in senior leadership, of the 36 <coughs> people that run the university, what we call President's Executive Leadership Council, there's seven women. One, by the way, I'm the only person of color. So just that's the vibe. But I'm not going to talk about that. Um, and those seven women are called upon to be mentors in somewhat of an unfair way, constantly to women across campus in a way that I'm like, wow, another man's gonna ask me to be a mentor? Like, there I go again, you know, performing my, no, no, no. And, and so then there's all this pressure and a, a faculty member for tenure and mentorship and all that stuff. It's, there's a dearth of role models and it matters who our role models are. Now, my whole life I've benefited from women and men, white, uh, Polynesian, who all championed me. So what I'm saying is if I don't ever see people, like frankly my brother, who is one of my role models in terms of going after some things, then I might not ever wonder if I could, if I could do something. Gendered career paths and gendered work. Again, I, I, I would love to go through each one of these and give it its, it, it, its due time, but I'm gonna have you read through these. Um, but basically, each one of these, the second generation gender bias basically says overall that first generation gender bias is you're a woman, I think you belong over here. It's explicit, right? I mean, it's, it's cold, it's nasty, it's stuff that we had in, um, uh, well, we probably have some today, but we saw more prevalent uh, 20, 30 years ago, where people would literally just say, you're a woman, you belong here. Now it's a little bit more covert. It's, I think you're so talented. Will you take notes at the meeting? Um, so it's, 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 it's the second generation of that bias that comes out in subtle ways because we just think that secretarial roles, right? So again, one thing that I try to be conscious of is if I'm ever in a meeting where somebody needs to take notes, I'm like, I'll take notes, I'll take it. Like, just, I just volunteer just because I'm like, this part of me is like, okay, I don't ever want anybody to ask anybody, I'll, I'll just take notes. My handwriting sucks, but I'll take notes. We're going to talk about access to networks and sponsors. Folks, look at this, informal networks informal networks, going to lunch, to breakfast with, how about trading cards, business cards, how about going golfing, how about going to the country club, how about going to all these traditional spaces of power and privilege that where networks are formed, who has access to these? And again, again, I'm not saying, 
men are bad people. All right, I'm saying that have we ever considered that these informal networks where deals are being made, people are being mentored, are being exposed to how deals should be made, are happening in informal ways. Double binds, and this comes from Cheryl Sandberg, if anybody read Lean In, powerful text. And she has a whole section on the double bind. And what is the double bind? It's basically the moment women start to, to express themselves in what were considered traditional masculine ways, or assert themselves, then they are negatively criticized, right? Because they're no longer feminine or um, in our traditional gender roles. Okay, let me move on. Safe identity workspaces. You can read through there again. Ah, let's do more time. Um, leadership programs, peer mentors, uh, affinity groups or communities where people can connect and, and that the institution, the organization actually fosters this. But they actually say, go and take some time. And, and, and encourages these affinity groups and connecting points. Common experiences um, where Susan Madsen is doing this right now. This is what she's doing. She's, she's bringing people together to say, hey, I, I thought I was the only one experiencing that. And, and wow, so there's other people, and maybe we can all speak up together about it. Create accountability. Hold yourself accountable, and then hold others accountable. This is one of my favorites because what it does is it asks you every thought you have or everything that you go through, you just get used to this mental gymnastics of saying, where is that coming from? Where is my thought, my, my assumption coming from? And then I'm making a decision. And let me just justify why I'm making that decision. If I can articulate why I'm making a decision, it actually limits bias. Because then I have to say, this is why. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. OK, great. I feel like I'm not as biased in that moment, right? I'm going to ask for feedback when, when talking to folks about, hey, is anything that I said did, did that, am I missing something, right? Um, hold others accountable. I love this. We're trying to encourage this now that in public meetings we actually call out man's <coughs> right? Somebody says something, a woman, a colleague says something, and somebody's like, I think what you mean to say, and I'm like, oh, no, she said it. Like, <laughs> she didn't mean to say this, like, she said it. So then, what do you mean to say? Like, right? So, right? I mean, just calling it out. And I've been called out. I'm not, I've, in the moment, it's stung, but I've grown from it, right? So it's not like I'm like over here like, oh, super sensitive guy. Like I've, I've been called out by colleagues, and it's super helpful. Make decisions collectively, because collective lenses <coughs> limit individual bias. Does that make sense? Last two slides. Identify women in our lives. Let me just give you the thesis of this. Identify all the female influences in our lives. And I'm talking about not only family members, but I'm talking about um, whether it's your community, religious institution, your um, your sports team that you're on, a roller derby that you're on, a team that you're on. Um, if you're on with uh, at your workplace, whatever women are in your lives. And then also, the women who are in your lives by proxy, the musicians you listen to, the actresses, the speakers, the Facebook feeds and Instagram people you follow. Because whether you like it or not, they're influencing you, okay? And so what happens then is you you map it and you basically do an analysis and say, what am I learning about women from women, <laughs> uh, successful women? Like, what am I learning about what they're doing? And this set of women is teaching me that I need to be more like reserved and docile and I need to be in my place. But then I see a whole bunch of women over here that are saying it's okay that I don't do that. And so begin to map, and I'm not saying that you have to be, that it's just place blame and be like, ooh, I wanna cut this person out of my life because they're, it's just simply waking up to the fact that people are influencing you without even realizing it um, so much of the time. Oh, and by the way, map the history and frequency of celebration of women, that's an institutional thing. Before President Holland arrived, we had zero buildings at UVU named after women. Since he's been here, we've now had four buildings named after women. And that has been not just by accident. Folks, that has been a deliberate effort by President Holland, by Paige Holland, by others, Susan Madsen and others, to say, have we considered that we can actually see women's names on buildings around them, facilities around them, right? Finally, leadership purpose. Let's stop focusing on what shade of lipstick is the more powerful shade. Like, this is actually research that people have said, this works, and then other, now more scholars are saying, let's not focus on that. And I tend to agree that let's not focus on that. Let's focus on helping people find where they're gonna make the most authentic and purposeful impact in this world. And once people find that, impact, it almost doesn't matter whether or not they're good enough over here. They're going to make a difference. It's the same question when 
mixed race students ask me, like uh, somebody will say, I'm from the Navajo, I'm Navajo, but I grew up here in, in Springville and I, I don't feel like I'm a part of the Native American community or here, or they said, I'm, I'm Mexican American, I grew up in South Texas, and Nicola Cali, Nicola I'm not a part of there, Mexico or America, I sort of live in the border. Or LGBT students who self identify with a religious association, they say, I just, I don't feel welcome in any sort of space. And what I tell them is I say, look, you're, finding, you're trying to find your authenticity with markers from everybody else, approvals from everyone else. Find your authenticity by first find what you're fighting for and find who you're fighting for. The moment you find those two things, therein lies your authenticity. And therein lies your impact. You find out who you're fighting for and what you're fighting for, and then this other stuff becomes noise. And I promise you, you're gonna have an impact. You may not have CEO position, and I may not have CEO position, but we're gonna have an impact on whatever sphere of influence that we're in right there. Folks, I just appreciate you being willing to, to indulge me that I can just share with you some of this journey. Um, and I, I invite you to connect on LinkedIn. Here's my email address. But we're gonna hand this out at the very end. Can I just say, um, I really appreciate anybody's willingness to get better at getting a healthier disposition towards difference. I hope nobody felt attacked tonight. If you did, please email me and let's have a conversation. But I'm also hoping that we get better at this. We wake up, we do things within our privileges and in our power to open doors of opportunity for those who have historically not had it. Thanks so much for letting me.